people ask me where I came up with the idea. I was working on the Disney lot, and I knew some child stars. There was one in particular, and this kid was on a hit show, one of the most popular uh, child stars in the early 90s, mid-90s. Every girl wanted to date him, every guy wanted to be him. But the reality of his life, he was a sad kid. His dad wasn't in his life. One of the executives you know, would take him fishing occasionally. On the X Journal, it was he always had to be on. He always had to be on. Wherever he went, there was a crowd, there was a line. Internally, it was a different reality. That difference between that dichotomy between the internal and the external, that fascinated me. For Clay, all he knew is he had this desire to get it all back. To take back every false perception of who they said he was. Just for a day, he wanted the inside and the outside to be the same. We all run in one way or another. Clay's been on the run for 15 years. Some of us we're standing still, but we're running. Some of us are running, but standing still. For Clay, he doesn't know the difference between doing something bad and being bad. That's really what was going on in this scene. Do you know the difference? Honestly, it's a tree we could all hang from. <laughs> There's a difference between doing something bad and then beginning to believe that you yourself are bad. On the other end of the spectrum, we can buy into the lie that being good makes us worthy of being loved and being all right and being comfortable in our own skin. That's just the other side of the coin, just as powerful as a lie. How do we come to have a healthy self, a healthy identity? The first line of this book is, it's one thing to believe in something when you don't need it to be true. It's another when everything is riding on it. Think of all the things we say we believe in no matter what it is, about the environment, about God, about uh, life, until you have a real need, and you need that to be true, that's a scary place to be. We all go over the falls in life. And whether it was your fault or not, it's always an opportunity to be transformed, to have this furnace of transformation. When you're separated from everything you've put your identity in, getting back to Clay for a minute in the book, I wasn't interested, the question I was inter interested in was not does restoration exist? Does God exist? Does recovery um, exist? The question I was interested in was how real is it? There are these falls in Cliff Falls. You would think there would be falls in Cliff Falls. <laughs> and they're hard to find. They're hard to get to. They're on the postcards, they're on the phone book. But few people have seen them. Clay wants to know, are they really real? Or are they just this bubbling brook? Clay, like myself, and maybe some of you, have organized our lives so at a minimum, we just don't have to be disappointed. We can deal with any harsh reality in life. 
as long as we didn't get our hopes up and then have them smash down. So Clay lives this life where he just doesn't get disappointed, just doesn't get his hopes up. I'm going to read you a passage now where Clay finally stumbles upon the falls. And the confession is the turning point, but this is really uh, the fruit of what happened in the confessional scene. Clay made his way up a rustic trail, the words repeating in his spirit. He noticed the magnificent oaks that lined his path. In the stillness, he listened to the quiet rustling of leaves as he continued along the trail. Soon he came upon the rushing falls the city was named for. Three separate falls emanating from one source. The site was majestic. Light filtered through the golden oak leaves above the rushing waters. Standing on a rock, he could see his shadow on the opposite bank of the river. The roar of the water plunging over the cliff, the outflow emptying to the river, cascading over the falls. Everything he was carrying was being swept away. The mighty roar was consuming him. The mighty roar was calling out his name. You are my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. The falls made everything come alive. He breathed in deeply. It was as if he was taking his first breath. By the time he made it back to town, something had changed. He had changed. The falls were flowing through him now. It was like he had sunk deep beneath the water, gasping for air, but had come up the other side. It wasn't safe. It wasn't supposed to be safe. But he'd be all right, and he wouldn't be alone. He didn't know which had been more frightening. God or life. When he was underneath, he was alone, and it was scary, and for a few moments, unbearable. But then he emerged, and he was all right, and somehow changed. The transformation that had eluded him, like all observers who just stand on the banks, was finally there. Knowing who you are not, Clay realized, was always the beginning of change. But until you hear your true name, you will wander. And perhaps I'll should for a time. Thank you. I did an interview last week, and they asked me if I have any special insight into child stars and why so many of them end up notorious and in trouble. And one of my answers was, Many of them, all they know is what they're not. I'm not that thing. I'm not that kid on that sitcom. I'm not that people pleaser. I'm not that performer. But they haven't had the time to develop or go through that process, process of saying, who am I? What do I want? Knowing what you are not is not enough. It's only half of the equation. That's very true for Clay, and I think it's true for a lot of us. <laughs> for a lot of us. I started this project as a TV pilot. I thought, okay, that's a very easy kind of a, my, I knew television, that was my background. I thought that was a kind of an easy form to kid, a child star hiding in a church. That's a, that's a great setup. I got very far with it. Um, USA liked it as a movie of the week. Showtime wanted to sex it up beyond belief. They, uh, 
Could the, <laughs> could the pastor be a meth addict? Could, uh, <laughs> I mean, no integrity at all. Just, just. Um, I made it into a movie of the week. And by the time I was done, USA stopped making movies of the week. And then I'm like, what am I going to do here? Back to the drawing board. So I met a producer. He said, Cliff, work backwards. Make it a film. Write a screenplay. Then it can become a TV series. OK, went to the Writers Guild, read every version of um, every movie that I liked. That's how I taught myself how to write screenplays. All my earlier work all looked like Goodwill Hunting. Um, <laughs> Um, I got very far with that. I got it to the president of a studio. And at that point, it had been six years. And the president said, we love it. We love it. But you know what? All our movies are based on books. <laughs> Have you thought of it as a novel? I said, I am not writing a novel. This has been six years of my life. He said, it'll take you six months. It took four more years. Ten years of my life. People ask if it's my story. Here's the confession. The other confession. I wasn't a child star. I don't have an addiction. The earlier versions of this story, the TV pilot, it, there was very little of me in it. But with each incarnation, it became deeper and richer. And now when I read this novel, I'm on every page. Every page, I'm there somewhere. The reviews that I've really enjoyed are people who kind of get that. One said, you know, I'm a very subtle writer. I left space for you to bring your wound to the story. And I think that's why people are resonating with it the way they are. At one event, uh, Marie, Marie, oh, I met her twice. Now, I want to give you one little bit of backstory. There's a spiritual message. It's a mainstream book, but there is a spiritual message. My atheist friends like it. My Jewish friends like it. It's nothing heavy hitting. And I respect where everybody is with a sense of higher power. I'm speaking from my experience. So I just want to say that, you know, no agenda here. First time I met Marie, she said she was apprehensive. She heard about the book. I'm an atheist. Second time I met her, uh, they surprised me. There was a panel of people who had been impacted by the novel, and she was there. And this is what she said. I always knew I was going to have to stand before God for the things I did in life. But I never knew if God would understand the circumstances surrounding those choices. She then said, for the first time in her life, she thought she actually was allowed or had permission to love herself. She had permission to love herself. That maybe she wasn't all those horrible things that she had heard and continued to hear in her own mind. She then said she bought a plane ticket. And she was going to Denver, to Colorado, to confront her father and tell him she forgave him. And it was only then that we all realized the real reality of abuse that was in her life. And how many years she was blaming herself and thought she was that thing that... I can't take credit for this. I can't. At best in life, we're some sort of a vessel. Probably my favorite line in the whole book, it says, Reagan says it to Clay at the end. The only words that matter, 
the only words that matter flow from the cracks in our spirit through the breaches in our resolve. It makes the 10 years worth it. it. Makes the 10 years worth it. In October of 1996, at age 26, I went over the falls of my own life. It started, I was working at Disney, working all over the lot. I was acting a bit, um, nothing impressive. I had a bad French accent on a soap opera, a couple lines, um, but I was trying to do that thing. And I started getting a series of fevers, 105, 106, 107. Prior to October, I had had seven fevers prior to that date. I was getting thinner. I was, my personality was changing. I was becoming very irritable, very irritable. I would get upset if a waitress made a mistake. I mean, that wasn't how I was. I was getting worked up about everything. We knew something was going on. And I was going to doctor after doctor. But I'd get the fever, and then I'd have a measure of health. So the advice was, you kind of type A. I'm like, really? <laughs> you need to back off. Back off, Cliff. Take it easy. Rest. Don't push yourself so hard. Don't be so driven. <sighs> series of events happened. One doctor said, it has to stop now. Just stop everything you're doing. Go rest. Go away. Where did I go? I came to the desert. I checked in at the Hotel Esmeralda. And in those days, uh, this was 15, 16 years ago. In those days, there wasn't much developed around it between the 10 and the hotel. Well, that night, around 2 in the morning, I started um, having the same symptoms again, but more extreme. Real weakness. The vertigo came back. The room was spinning. And at that point, I made an unwise decision. I tried to drive home. Not so smart. Not so smart. I got maybe a mile or two away from the hotel. And my body at this point was shaking very violently. And I should have gone here, <laughs> Eisenhower. <laughs> but I didn't. <laughs> Why? I had been to doctors, and I was afraid they'd say, oh, it's anxiety. It's a panic attack. It's because I didn't have a name. We now know, uh, looking back, that I was going into anaphylactic shock. And I could have died that night. When I got two miles away, I stopped the car because I just couldn't even drive anymore. And I got out of the car. I was freezing, even though it was like you know middle of the night in the desert. It's, it's hot still. And I was putting my hands on the hood of the car, trying to warm myself. And I was on the side of the road I don't know how long. And all I know is my life was never the same after that night. That was the worst night of my life. Somehow I made it back to the hotel, and I spent, eventually made it back there. I don't even remember how. God is my witness. I spent the remainder in that lobby waiting for that sun to come out. For the next two years, first year and a half, I was almost primarily in bed. Over the first seven years, I saw 70 doctors in seven years. I had a specialist for everything. I didn't have a name. I didn't have a name. I lost friends. My world became small and isolated. Friends didn't understand what was going on. How sick is he? OK, something's up, but is he really, really sick? Does he just not want to work? Like, I'm not type A. Everything about me was being questioned. 
and it was a pretty dark place. Now, I was reluctant to share this story. One newspaper heard about it, and they titled the article, Illness Inspires Debut Novel. Great. And I was reluctant to share it because there's always some celebrity on TV talking about their courageous battle with gingivitis. I mean, everybody is... <laughs> Everybody is always exploiting what they went through and their brave battle. So I only share this that maybe there's something useful here. Some of the lessons I learned, might, you might find your own story here too. That's my motivation. Um, seven years in, I got to a research hospital, Cedars, and a doctor um, diagnosed me with a bacteria in my system that had built up. And it was creating an autoimmune reaction that my body was trying to kill it and was like attacking itself. And so I, that's why I had problems, kidney stuff, heart stuff, thyroid, you name it. Um, I asked him, OK, what do we do? What do we do? Let's, uh, you know, let's make a list. <laughs> he goes, it's going to be hard to kill. So we, we tried all these different antibiotics, didn't work. They tried pre-digested food. They give it to stroke patients. The most rancid thing you could ever imagine. Oh my gosh, it smells like puke, and you've got to drink it like every like two hours. Because when you eat, it feeds the bacteria. Didn't work. So finally I said to him, well, what will work? He said, Maybe a fast. And I'm like, you mean like Lent? I can do that three days. <laughs> now, that's all it is? <laughs> and he said, no. And he just kind of laughed because it was impossible. He said, you'd have to go 10 and a half days, water only. I said, OK. He goes, OK? At that point, I was so desperate to be healed. I would have done anything, anything. I know some people in this room, you know that place. You know when your value, your sense of self, your sense of worth, your motivation has all been in question and you've heard all the bad press on you and you're waiting for someone like a pastor to show up to give you a second chance, a third chance, a 20th chance. And you want to run and escape from it. And you finally get to that point and you say, I will do whatever it takes. So 10 days it was, 10 and a half days. And it was kind of humorous because, you know, to diagnose the bacteria, you breathe into a bag every 15, 15 minutes for three hours. And that's how they measure the bacteria. And I swear to you, the only magazine they had in that waiting room was LA's best restaurants. <laughs> I was watching the Food Network like it was like pornography. <laughs> but I did it. I did it. And the truth is, your appetite's suppressed after the first three days, and it's the idea of food. But I had a new measure of health instantly. You don't know what health is until you taste it again. You don't know that you've been that unhealthy until you have that experience. Four days ago, I was, I was trying to think, what am I going to say here? Because I wanted to change it up. I've been speaking a lot, two, three times a week places. And I didn't want to come in here with like a lecture something I had written out that was eloquent and you know, had the timing in it. and I just wanted to share my story, because that's largely what most people in this room do. They share the story. And so I was a little anxious. It may not be as polished. But I made a commitment, I'm just going to be myself. Love it, hate it. You had a free muffin in the show, so. <laughs> So 
So I went to Tony's Pizza, which is in the city where I live. And I'm like, nothing comforts like a slice of pizza, right? And something in me, I'm getting all this press. I got two new articles. Guy posted an article this week. Um, the Desert Sun did something. I got on NBC and all this kind of, wow, wow, wow. I just wanted a slice of cheese pizza. I wanted a normal experience. I just wanted to, you know, something in me just wanted to counter that. And so I saw this kid, and I mean, I guess I should change his name, just out of respect. We'll call him Rob. But I said, hey, Rob, he's like 26 years old. I said, I haven't seen you in a while. And he's worked at this pizza place since he was like 16, 17. And he looked different. And he walked up to me, and there was a hesitation in his voice. And he said, Cliff, I just got out of Betty Ford. Uh huh. He said, Yeah. I've been using since I was 16. I live a mile from my parents' house, and I can't get out of bed without doing a line, without doing cocaine, without doing heroin. I can't go a mile. Finally, I said I was ready, and my mom checked me in. And then we had this amazing conversation. Amazing conversation. He wanted to know, how do you not feel that self-hatred? How do you not feel that self-hatred? How do you separate the things you've done in life, which have consequences, and we have to live with those, from having that sense of, I'm OK, I'm beloved. How do you say that in the same sentence? I think the conversation helped both of us. And he also spent some time talking about what this place meant to him. And how one night, because he was on the medication coming off the drugs, and then finally the decision was, stop the medication, and now you're going to have to feel. And it's probably going to take three days for you to get through that detox. And it was really tough on him. And I guess he would shake violently, or I mean, as he explained it to me. And one night, he went on the couch because his roommate, he didn't want to disturb. And his roommate got out of bed and went and got him. And he goes, are you kidding me? And he brought him back into the room, put a blanket on him. And he said, that simple act of like someone caring about me helped me love myself. He wanted to be here today, and he, uh, he had some health um, issues. He caught a cold, um, had some breathing stuff going on, and he couldn't make it. I talked to him last night. But in my own experience, those years, seven years of sickness, and then there was another seven of getting healthy again and restoration, whatever that is. The first seven, I was isolated. And friends dropped away. And my words to you are, when we go over the falls in life, that's part of the deal. God will put new people in your life. But sometimes there's a gap between the old and the new. And there were a few people who stuck with me straight through. A couple of them are in this room. I don't forget. When you've been sick for a long period of time, you start to blame yourself, even if it isn't technically your fault. And my mom said something. My mom was, my dad was incredible. I got to give him props. My sister and my brother-in-law, you know, because I always talk about my mom. <laughs> <laughs> they all stuck by me, supported me. I ended up in the bedroom at my parents' house. I thought it was only going to be a few months. I packed up my old apartment. I think it would be a few months, and 15 years of my life went by. 
what my mom said to me in that moment was, Cliff, just because you're the one who's sick, don't assume this is only your test. This is a test for everybody in your life. Every friend you had, every person, every doctor who didn't believe you at first until they got the blood work. There's a narcissism that can set in when you're sick, when you're going through something, when you have an addiction. Because it's all about you trying to get healthy. So one of my lessons was, it's not all about me. Even my sickness isn't about me. All about me. I had a recurring dream. Probably had it once a month or so over those years. I would go back to my old apartment. As I said, I had moved out of there, moved back into the bed, bedroom that I grew up in. And in this dream, I would re-enter that apartment. And everything would be exactly where I had left it. Every picture frame with every friend that I knew would stick by me through thick and thin. Every book on my bookcase that I was reading at the time, my CDs, my video cassettes. <laughs> my old life, covered in cobwebs. And in this dream, the neighbors would come back and say, you finally came back. We've been waiting for you. You forgot to come back. You forgot to come back. Even when I was healthy, I didn't want to come back to my life. The world wasn't safe. I, had, I like a quiet life. Let me live my life. I don't want to re-enter it. It was the book. I didn't expect, when I wrote this book, that this, a lot of the press would be about me personally. I even changed my name to CB. You know, Cliff Falls, wink, wink, you know, by CB Shipe. I thought I'd be anonymous. And then I got on Facebook because of the book, and you know, every person I ever knew in junior high instantly is my friend. And I'm grateful, very grateful. But it thrusted me out. And Did you ever see the movie Castaway? I cry like a baby in that thing. It's not when he's on the island. It's when he tries to come home. Tries to come back to his old life. And no one's wrong or, you know, it's not personal. Just time has moved on. Time has moved on. All my friends, married, kids, on their second house, their next promotion. And I'm hanging out in the bedroom at my parents' house, which wasn't bad, by the way. <laughs> and you have to begin to imagine your life beyond what you first imagined it would be. You have to mourn the life that you thought you'd have so that you could open yourself up to what God does have for you. I would not go back. I wouldn't want to go through it again. I would not go back. The falls, going over them, the whole cycle, it changed me. It changed me. And the struggle for Clay and the struggle for me is every day living in that integrity of how it changed me and how it is changing me, and who it is making me um, as a man. When I'd see people from the past, the hardest times would be, they want to relate to me as they knew me 20 years ago. Because they can't see right away who I am now. And I can only imagine recovery, you might experience, change in friendships people you can't hang out with anymore because they don't want a better life, they don't want to be healed. I wonder if it would have made a difference. I wonder if it would have made a difference had I known all those years ago when I left that apartment 
that I would become a bestseller first at this revered bookstore called Vroman's, which was two blocks away. Two blocks away from where I thought everything ended. Or if I knew that I'd be invited to speak at this guidepost conference. I get that. This just happened to be in the same lobby of the same hotel where I had my worst night all those years ago. Or even that I'd have an interview last week at NBC on the same lot where I spent, did probably 50 episodes of a show, and would just sit in those hallways dreaming of what my life would be like and I hadn't been back to in 16 years. It was as if God was restoring me on the same soil where everything came to an end. The same soil. When you're in it, you can't pray for yourself. I learned that from my mom. You need people to stand in that gap. You need community as best as you can. It's only looking back that you can see the hand, that there was something going on there, that you were not alone. I really... I'm just going to leave you with this. It's a choice. It's a choice to believe that you are the beloved. It's a truth, but it's a choice. You will find what you're looking for. If you are looking and hunting and seeking what is most depraved about you, your worst secrets, the worst things you've ever done, you're going to find it. If you dig hard enough, that's what you're looking for, that's what you'll find. And if you're searching for what's redeemable about you, what's good, you're going to find that. But if you can see or understand that like this light is on me right now, that it's coming towards me, and I can stand in it, I can bask in it, and anything good I do is just a response to that, and I can look over here and hate myself or blame myself, but that's not going away. That's a choice. Um, I'm not a mental health professional. <laughs> um, I'm not uh, advocating a 13th step. <laughs> but I got one little suggestion. When you say your name, if I was an alcoholic, I would say I'm Cliff and I'm an alcoholic. And I get a greeting. I'm not alone. It kind of makes me wish I was an alcoholic. Not <laughs> terrible. But I got to tell you, I've been spending time with people in recovery. And I have seen the community. We've had practices in God's garage. And, you know, afterwards, they have a woman's group, a men's group. People are coming with cupcakes. I'm like, is this a church? What is this? But when you say your name, I'm Cliff and I'm an alcoholic. Maybe just take a pause for a moment and say or even just hear it. I'm Cliff, the beloved child of God, and I'm an alcoholic. Thank you.